Okay, so I am going to talk about deliverance. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I kind of got started in this area, ministering in this area in, uh, in the early 1980s. I was attending, in 1981, I was attending Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. I was going to a, uh, attending a class that was a field ed class that was taught by a local pastor. And the field ed classes were taught by pastors. And so we were, we were meeting at a church. And, <coughs> and there was a guy that was doing some very creative, innovative things that I wanted to, I want, wanted to kind of learn about. I mean, he was actually uh, the, a mission pastor of the church that we were meeting in. But he was like meeting in the YMCA, you know, having church on Saturday night or Sunday nights only. He was doing uh, small groups, home groups, things like that. And, and so in, in the early 80s, there was a large uh, church growth movement that was going on. And I, and I wanted to, you know, kind of, he was right in the middle of that. So I just wanted to learn. <coughs> so I was taking this, this, you know, it was on a Monday night. Uh, after class on one, one of the Monday nights in the fall of 1981, I, I, you know, you go up there to the professor sometimes, to the teacher, you want to talk to them, find out uh, how things are going, and, uh, and you know, just kind of get to know the person a little bit better. You know, you know you, students do that all the time, you know, you schmooze up to them. You want a good grade, right? That wasn't really nice. Well, the reason I was doing that, but <clears throat> but it didn't hurt. <clears throat> anyway, the, he w- we were in this conversation, and uh, he's telling us a little bit about his day. He, he said, "You know, today we ministered to three people who had demons." I thought, "Wow, really? I mean, this is like New Testament stuff. I mean, this is really the stuff. I, was, I mean, I'm intrigued. I go, I've never done that before. Actually, I had encountered demonized people before. I just didn't recognize that's what I was dealing with. I said, oh, okay. And, you know, like, tell me more. You know, I want to hear more. He said, and then he said, and two of them were Christians. I go, oh, I didn't like that. I mean, the first thing that popped in my head was like, oh, I don't believe in that. Actually, I'd never really thought through what I believed in that area. I never developed a theology. It, 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 hadn't cre- it had never crossed my mind. So I'm like, okay. Uh, but, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't believe in that. And all I know is that at that moment, I had to get out of there. I'm like, I, I got I to gotta go. I got I to gotta get out of here. And, and so I... I said, oh, my goodness, look at the time. I mean, my, my wife should be expecting me. I, I need to get, I just, I'm sorry. So anyway, what I did is that I excused myself, and then I'm driving home, and I'm going, Christians having demons? I mean, how is this, how, how is this possible, Christians having demons? As I'm, and as I'm thinking through this, as I'm driving home, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit broke through in my thinking and spoke to me so clearly. It wasn't audible. It could have been, but it was really clear. It wasn't, but it was really clear. And says, Rodney, that's, that's what you have. Hey, guys, we'll be right back to the message. I just wanted to let you know that Voice of the Apostles, one of our flagship conferences, is happening soon. We have amazing speakers, including Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, Dr. Randy Clark, and many others. We'd love to see you there in person, but if you can't make it, you can also attend online. Click the link to learn more. Now back to the message. I got mad. Now I'm not really thinking anything out. I'm just reacting. I go, you can't have me. You don't, you can't be here in Jesus name. I command you to leave me. <clears throat> and I felt this thing leave me. <clears throat> then I thought, oh no. <laughs> I've just had an experience I don't think I believe in. Well, all I know is that I wasn't going to tell anybody what happened to me. I mean, it was, I, I got home and, and uh, didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell that guy. I'm like, I don't even know what happened to me. I realize now that those thoughts that I had, 
that I don't believe in this. Those weren't my thoughts. And, but I embraced those as my thoughts because they sounded like me. And, and so I, I, I just, I, I didn't want to, you know, I had to kind of work this thing through. So I, I did. And it uh, took a few, a few months or so. But I went through this process of learning about this area for the next five or six months. Now, I didn't really start ministering in this until the summer of 1982, and, that, and that's another story that I will tell. I think Friday morning I have a couple of sessions back-to-back on this, and we'll, I'll tell some of those particular stories. But all I know is that what, after I got my own freedom, I, I really didn't want to minister in this area at all. I just wanted to kind of learn about it. I wasn't planning on ever doing it. But I started attracting demonized people to my church. <laughs> and in January of 82, we moved up to Washington State. So I pastored up in the Seattle area, you know, eight and a half years before we went down to the San Francisco Bay Area for 23 and a half years. And so my learning about deliverance was really kind of a hands-on learning because in the early 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of material that was balanced that was written about this. There were practitioners who were doing it, but there weren't that many really good books. In fact, some of them were kind of scary. And, and you know, like most of the, I think a lot of the deliverance books, is, it's about eat the cherries and spit out the pits because there's going to be some wacko stuff in all of them, except the one I wrote, of course, you know. <clears throat> <laughs> But my journey has been a journey with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and it's been a journey of, of learning how to do and minister in a way because I shifted. So I'm, what I'm going to be sharing with you, and, and most of that's going to be on Friday morning, tomorrow morning. I'm acting like Friday is like several days off. <laughs> is, is we're going to be talking a lot about, you know, just the things that God has taught me in, the, in my journey. Because how I started off is not how I do it today. And uh, thank the Lord, I don't do it like I did it when I started. But it was, a, it was a journey. But the way the Lord trained me was I started attracting demonized people. And I was pastoring a Southern Baptist church. <clears throat> By the way, there's something about Baptists. Baptists, you know, they might not embrace all the gifts, but they do believe there's a devil, Okay. So you'll, you'll have a lot of them that do a lot of deliverance, even though they may not do some of the other stuff. But I started attracting demonized people, and that's, that's how I learned. I mean, a guy comes in my office and says, I don't know, every time I come to Sunday morning, I just see everybody, I just feel like slitting everybody's throats. I go, oh, that can't be good. I moved, I moved down to the San Francisco Bay Area, and when this church is asking me to come, and it's actually a very traditional Southern Baptist church. I, I stayed in the Southern Baptist, by the way. And it, it was a charismatic Baptist church. All my churches ended up being charismatic Baptist churches. <laughs> They, 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 when, they, when they asked me to come as their pastor, <clears throat> I said, I don't think you really want me to come. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, I just want you to know it. You know, I, I happen to, to attract a strange kind of clientele. <laughs> and they said, no, that's okay. You know, we're California. <laughs> you know, land of fruits and nuts. We understand how this works. <laughs> but after being there just a couple of years, they said, oh, man, we know what you're talking about now. So it was, a, it, was, it was a learning, it was a learning curve uh, for me along the way. And I did attract these, these people. It's like I always seem to attract them. I don't know why. I don't, I'm looking around here and see if there's... Yeah. 
I was at a Southern Baptist church about five or six years ago on Sunday morning, traditional Southern Baptist church, when a satanic priest walks into the early morning service and comes, sits on the third row, robe, tattoos, everything. And my wife, she was pretty, I mean, this, this was always kind of normal for us. We always kind of, you know, the people who'd come to the church, I mean, they were, we, we got stories. But, you know, these people, it actually activated their protocol. They never had anything like this. You know, in Texas, you know, I don't know if it, how it is in Florida, but, you know, people carry to church. You know what I mean, carry? Okay. <clears throat> they don't usually allow open carry in churches, but, the, you know, the state does. But, but you know, the churches have a protocol, in, you know, set up so that if something strange happens... If a guy rushes the stage, they're going, to, they're going to take him out. You know I mean? That's, that's kind of the way that they're, they're set up with. It actually activated the protocol for the very first time. Everybody took their stations. I'm like, how come everybody's sitting nice? Like <laughs> In California, a guy calls the church, and he, and he speaks to my, my, my uh, sec, secretary. And she, he says, hey, does, does your pastor do weddings of people who aren't church members? She said, yeah, sometimes he does that. She goes, okay, well, this is a different kind of wedding. He, she said, well, what do you mean? She, she, he says, well, you know, I, I want to marry my ghost. She said, ghost? Are we talking like Casper, you know, type of a thing? <laughs> he said, well, it's something like that. She says, well, she said, well, you know, I don't know that he does those kinds of weddings. <laughs> but I'll go ahead and take your name and your phone number and give it to him. And if he does, I, he'll give you a call. She handed it to me, and I, I was thinking, my first, my first thing I wanted to do, I wanted to give it to one of my associate pastors <laughs> and say, listen, I can't, I, I'm not able to do this one. Do you think you can handle this one for me? But I thought that would be kind of cruel, so I didn't do that. But I told her, I said, what, you know, what you should have told him is that before I do any wedding, I always do premarital counseling. If he'd like to get his ghost and bring his ghost in, I think we can help him take care of that one. Anyway, that's, that's, this is how I learned, okay? I just started attracting, you know, demonized people. And a lot of people say, well, Rodney, I don't, you know, when did you start your deliverance ministry? And I said, well, I never really had a deliverance ministry. In fact, people with deliverance ministry usually scare me, you know? I said, what I have is let's bring people into the fullness of their, of their identity and their destiny. But in doing that, we have to remove constraints off of them. So I think you need to see a deliverance ministry, especially in the, in the church, that it's about removing constraints so that people can come into their destiny. So it's about empowering the person. And so that's one of the things that we'll get into a lot tomorrow is that it, deliverance should be an empowering experience for the person who's getting set free so that you pull them in to be a participant in the process, not a spectator in the process, and that you don't do the work for them, but that you help activate the authority that's inside of them to begin to walk out who they are. So that's kind of, that'll be where we'll, we'll be going in this, in this whole process here. But we're, I'm, let me just, just, just give you some things that, about building some confidence, because a lot of times people freak out when it comes to this area. So let's just, I'm going to spend this time just developing some confidence and ministering this area. And the first thing you need to realize is that whatever God calls you to do, he will empower you to do this. Now, God does have a way of throwing you into things like you think you're in the deep end to stretch you right? I mean, he, he's going to throw you into things that, you've felt, that you will feel inadequate and unprepared for. But God's grace is greater than any situation you find yourself in. And it's usually in those times that you actually grow, right? Now, I don't like that stretching part. Well, I'm sorry, but that's just kind of the way that it works. Uh, when the kingdom of God is about 
about declaring his, his rule and about demonstrating his rule. When you look in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching everywhere the good news about the kingdom, and he healed people who had every kind of sickness and disease. You'll see this, this particular thing mentioned several times, that Jesus had a two-step method. I'm going to teach on the kingdom, and then I'm going to demonstrate the kingdom, or I'm going to demonstrate the kingdom and then talk about the kingdom. It's about bringing the rule of God, the reign of God, into this world. We look in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. He called the 12 together, gave them power and authority over the, all the demons and to heal sicknesses or heal diseases, and then sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. When you go into the next chapter, chapter 10 of Luke, verse 1, you know, he, he anointed these 70 others. He sent them out, and then it says in verse 9, you know, heal those who are sick and then say to them, the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God has come near you. So it's about bringing the rule and the reign of heaven to this earth. And this commission is still our commission today. Most of us are very familiar with the gospel of reconciliation, but not with the gospel of the kingdom. We preach a gospel that just gets people reconciled to God which really reconciliation is the first step of coming into the kingdom of God. That's how you get into the kingdom. Jesus said in, in John chapter 3, verse, verse 5, that, you know, unless a person is born of water and, and, uh, and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So you really, you, your born again experience gets you into the kingdom of God. But once you come into the kingdom, it's all about bringing the rule of, of heaven it, and so we're familiar with reconciliation, but we have a powerless Christianity because that's only gospel we, we've preached has been reconciliation. It'd be, it's, it's, like, it's like you come into a house and you go through the front door and now you're into the foyer and you stay in the foyer your whole life until you die. Then you go out the back door through eternity and you miss living in the house. When Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, and by the way, that word kingdom is used about a hundred times in the gospels alone. When, he, when, he, when they preached the gospel of the kingdom, it was about bringing the rule of heaven on, into this earth. And that's the, that's, that's the commission that we still have. In fact, you're supposed to be praying that. Thy kingdom I mean, if it, Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I mean, yeah, I ask most people, most time when I teach on the kingdom, and I'm kind of getting off the subject here, but, you know, when I teach on the kingdom, it, it's going to be, I always ask people, give me a definition of the kingdom in one or two sentences, and most Christians can't. And Ephesians, I mean, in Matthew 6, says, we're so, supposed to be seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, and it, I mean, shouldn't you, I mean, if you're supposed to be seeking it first, shouldn't you know what you're seeking? All right, got to get off that course, get back on course. All right. John 14, 12, Jesus said, the things that I do, you're going to do in greater things than this because I go to the Father. And he prefaced that by not only you, he said, anyone who believes in me, this is going to be, you're going to walk in the works that Jesus walked in to do what he did, and to do greater things than that. The, the 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is preaching, and Paul is, or, or he's, you know, writing here. He says, when I came to you guys, I didn't come try, trying to impress you in those first few verses, uh, but, it, but verse 3 says, well, I was with you in weakness and in fear, much trembling. Verse 4, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So anytime we're preaching the word of God, there should be a demonstration of that. And the reason is in verse 5, he says, so that your faith does not rest on the wisdom of man, but, on, but upon the power of God. See, oftentimes, you know, people, they'll, they'll move from church to church and go to place to place because they like the teaching. And, I, and I, I'm all for good teaching. Hopefully you're going to get some of that this week, like maybe this morning. 
But what's really going to dive, put you deep, make you strong, are your encounters with God. Well, you have an encounter with him, an encounter with his power, so you can look back on that. I mean, they always told the, those, those guys in the Old Testament, go back and look at those stones that were taken from the Jordan. When well, your faith gets weak, go look at what God did then. We have to look back on those times to get us through for our faith to be strong, not by sticking another CD or listening to another podcast. I mean, those might be helpful, but really, what are your encounters with God? So the thing is, we actually owe the world a, a God encounter. And one of the ways that this, or the, the ways of expanding the kingdom, the most common ways of that will be in healing the sick, casting out demons. It's a part of the, of the kingdom there. So if you're going to advance the kingdom of God, you, you will deal with the demonic. In fact, I, I think a, confronting the demonic should be normal Christianity. And the reason it's not normal is because we've actually created doctrines out of our experience, not out of the word. I went to a conference one time in, the, in my early years, and I'm, uh, this guy was uh, teaching. It was a Baptist conference. It, actually, it was a, like a retreat setting. I don't know how I ended up in this workshop. So I'm, I wish I hadn't, but I did. And so this guy was talking about it. He says, you know, I think demons is just the New Testament's way of describing mental illness. And I said, okay. Does this mean that only the mentally ill people could recognize Jesus as being the Son of God? <laughs> and, and I mean, is, is that why those pigs ran off into the water? Because, you know, he put the mental illness in those pigs? I mean, you know, I mean, when the Bible, when it describes these demons, it describes them as having a volitional will. I mean, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 44 through 46, what, you know, whenever a spirit leaves a person, it goes into the dry places looking for rest. And not having found any, then returns. It makes a decision to come back. And then it makes the decision to take seven worse. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about the demonic in the sense like their origin. We have some of the things relating to angels and fallen angels, and that's pretty much my perspective of what I believe really demons are. But what the Bible does do, it does tell us how to get rid of them. So don't worry about where they came from or how they organize themselves or something like that. Listen, if it's in the Word of God, God, God gives you enough in His Word to address this area. You don't need other information. Now, sometimes God will give intercessors some strategies and things like that to pray into, and I'm talking about that. But I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, do not get intrigued with the darkness. A little old lady comes to me one time, one of the conferences like this, she comes up and she says, hey, I got a book I, I wrote I want to give you. And I go, I mean, she's like somebody's grandma. And I look, I said, oh, okay. So she hands me this book and I look at this and I go, what is it? She says, well, it's all about the strategies of, of the demonic, how they organize themselves, what they do, how, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, where did you get this information? And she started looking guilty. I said, you've been talking to demons, haven't you? I said, no, I don't need that. I don't even want to read that. So and you, can get, you can get sucked into that side, and they will take you out and disable you. So don't worry about it. Just, just understand, you know, that you got enough to, to, to get rid of them. But you're going to have to have this attitude about yourself, an attitude where you are convinced, convinced that you have absolute authority because Jesus has absolute authority. You got to be convinced of the completed work of Jesus, that when Jesus died on the cross, it was an absolute victory over the kingdom of darkness. And so, and, it, and I think it's got to reflect in an attitude of, of faith, not an attitude of fear. I mean, Paul said this in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter eight, this, just to typify the attitude, Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, I am convinced I am convinced that neither life, nor, nor angels, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present or the future, or any powers, any height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God 
that is in Christ Jesus. I mean, he's just, he's got an attitude here. And I think we have to have this attitude because whenever we minister in this area, you've got to know who you are, the authority that you have, and not express any fear. Because I'll tell you, if you got fear, I'm, they, they, they smell fear. You know, one of the reasons that demons manifest is to invoke fear on you and to get you to quit. When they manifest, that's actually the last card that they play because they thrive in darkness. They thrive in secret. They thrive without being, they do their best work when you don't know that they're there. So when they do manifest, I oftentimes get a little excited. I go, whatever I'm doing is working. We're bringing some light to this thing, and they're exposing themselves. You need to be convinced that Jesus has absolute authority in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus told his disciples, I've been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. This was after the resurrection. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, this says, talks, talks about Jesus. He is far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Colossians would, would say this in uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they are powerless. So that's a great verse. You know, the devil has been completely stripped of all of his authority. Now, here's where the confusion happens for us, is that we're thinking, okay, if, if the devil has been completely stripped, he sure seems to be able to do a whole lot. Right? Well, you see, Jesus, what he did on the cross, stripped him of his authority, but did not strip them of their created design. There are things in their created design that they still can do. Now, let's think about, let's think about angels. Because demons are fallen angels. Let's think, think about angels themselves. Now, we know that angels, uh, they, they, don't, they, they, don't, they don't get hot, I don't think, or cold. Uh, they don't have to eat. I mean, we have angel food cake. But... Uh, <laughs> They're, they, they, they're created beings that exist in a realm that we're unfamiliar with because of our limitations. But the, it, that realm is a true realm. It's a real realm. In fact, it's more real than the world that we actually see. And in this room right now, we know that there, the angelic is in the room at the moment. Right? Right? You can't see them, but at least I don't see them. Maybe you, you're one, some, some of you do, but I don't see them. I don't, I, you know, I'm like, if one is standing here, oh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> but, if you, but if one is here, you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't know that. I can feel the presence at times, sense the presence of times. And so if you think about a demon that is a, a fallen angel, they still have that they still had that created design. Now, we know angels comes in all shapes and sizes. Have you, have you read Revelation that, I mean, those creatures that are like, got eyes all over them and stuff like that, and they're flying. I mean, I mean, angel, obviously the angelic comes in different sizes and shapes, and so, therefore, I would think the fallen ones would have some of the very th same things in there as well. Uh, but we know like with angels, angels can manifest and be physical too, right? You probably have had an encounter with an angel a few times in your life, not knowing that they were angels, maybe sometimes afterwards. With the demonic, they do some of the very same things. Now, let's suppose you're at somebody's house, because I'm, I'm sure this wouldn't happen at yours. 
But let's say you're at somebody's house and, you, and you're, you're, you're in the kitchen with them and you're noticing on the counter happens to be a water bottle. And then all by itself, with nobody touching it, it moves across the room by itself. And what do you do? Oh, no. Did you see that? There are demons here. So what, what, what's happening in the unseen realm? <clears throat> so in, in the unseen realm, you've got this spirit. He's got to hold the bottle. And he's looking at you. And then he sees you look. And then he goes... That fear just gave him your authority. <clears throat> they have no authority on their own. It's, they've been stripped of that. So they, the authority that they operate in is the authority that man gives them. They have no authority. And so whenever, we, whenever they do something like that, and we in fear, because fear is the opposite of, of faith, when that happens, then all of a sudden, what I, I gave that spirit that authority. Because they do something we're not familiar with, and so therefore we think they have authority. But Jesus, it, the Scripture says that Jesus stripped them completely bare of all authority. Now, you don't freak out with other parts of God's creation that, that do, do things you can't. You don't, you don't see a, a fish in the water and go, how's it doing that? It's breathing underwater by itself. Oh, that scares me. Oh, it's a bird. Oh, it just went from there to there. This is another part of the creation of God that does things that you cannot do. And because they, just because they do things, you don't need to be afraid of that. Principalities and powers. Okay, like where do they get their authority? Oh, and these are strong princes. Oh, these are strong. There's, there's principalities and powers over, this, over the, the Tampa Bay area. All right, well, where do they get their authority? They, Jesus says they've been stripped of authority. Therefore, the authority that they're operating on is the authority that man is giving them. How do you tear down a principality and a power in a region? Well, you find this model actually in the book of Luke chapter 10. Here are the people of God. You know, he sent these guys out. They come back and they said, you know... I mean, even the demons are subject to us in, in your name. And what, what does he say to them? He said, well, guys, don't get that excited that the demons are subject to you. Just get excited that your name's written in the book of heaven, right? And, and, and then he says, behold, he said, behold, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, and I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. So what happened? We had principalities of fall. What happened? What, did, what, what preceded that time is that they went out and did the work of the kingdom. They went out, preached the gospel of the kingdom, and they healed the sick, cast out demons. So the way that you remove principalities in, in a region, you minister to the people in the region and bring the kingdom of God into the lives of people that are putting them up. Now, sometimes in strategic level warfare, there were this, there was these people that basically said, well, you know, you got to get in the morning and you got to get, you know, you got to pull down those princes in the morning. So, okay, so we're going to get together in our prayer meeting, and in Jesus' name, we command all those princes, principalities, and powers that have come down off, off, uh, you know, uh, out of the Tampa Bay area. And so the principality and power, they fall, and then by, by early morning time, everybody has put them back up. <laughs> and you next morning, you take them out, and everybody puts them back up. Uh, you, how do you get rid of that cycle? You bring the kingdom of God. Amen. 
I'm all for praying. I don't pray like that anymore, but uh, that's another topic to talk on. You need to just consume yourself with the bigness and the greatness of God. If you got a big God, then you're going to have a small devil. If you're always talking about the devil and you focus on the devil, you're going to have a, be, have a big devil. But you got to be like David. I mean, David, when he faced Goliath, what happened? Goliath was small because he had a big God. He had spent time with God. And in his time with God, he, he, had in, he, he's, he, he just had a big God. And so when David came out, you know, he's, he's facing this, this giant there. Now, understand what the enemy uses. His tactics don't seem to be changing at all. He uses deception and intimidation. That's how, that, those are the tools. He uses those, those tactics because they are cheap and they work. But if you got a big God, intimidation is not going to work. David comes out. And do you remember the language that, that, that David used? I mean, here he stepped out and Goliath make, goes on with the intimidation. <laughs> Who am I, a dog? That you would see, you know, and, and he basically just says this. And, and of course, David, what does he do? David comes out and he responds. And just, just to sum it up, he says, you know, today you, you mess with the wrong God. And uh, it's not going to turn out very good for you at all. And he took out. Goliath, because he had a big God. You see, spiritual warfare begins with jumping into the a place of seeing God in his greatness and in his majesty. Spiritual warfare begins by focusing on the bigness and the greatness of God, because if you got a big God, you're not going to be intimidated by the enemy. So you have to have the attitude. In Matthew chapter 5, 14, Jesus tells his disciples that you are the light of the world. He would say, I am the light, but he says, you are the light of the world. That means if I'm the light of the world, everywhere that I go, I bring the light. There's not any darkness out there that I can't bring light to if I step into it. Because I carry the light. If I know that I carry the light... Then everywhere that I go, I bring the light. So, you, so, you know, you get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm, I'm, st- I'm going to put on the full armor of God. You know, I'm going to start with the helmet of salvation, breast, breastplate. I'm just going to put on the whole armor of God. And then I know that everywhere that I go, that, that I'm going to be salt and light. I am the salt of the earth, and I'm the light of the world. And so everywhere that I go, everywhere the sole of my feet treads, I am bringing the light of God into it. I go to work, I bring the light of God. I go into my family, I bring the light of God. And so you have to have this pretty much attitude of what you carry. I, I like the story in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, 15 through 18, where the servant of Elijah comes out in the morning and he freaks out because he sees... This whole army has surrounded them because they've come to take Elijah out because God's telling Elisha the secrets, <laughs> their secrets. And so they're going to come take him out. And now he's freaking out and goes, oh, no, look here. Look, look, they're going to, look at who's here. And Elijah said, will you just open up his eyes and let him see? And so he opens his eyes up. And what does it say there? Uh, he, he sees the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Any, I'm telling you, whenever you minister in this area, you, those who are with you are greater than the things that are out there. And, and if you're going to minister in this area, it's like for some reason all of the big angels always show up for this. We had a, in, in the church that I pastored in the Bay Area, Tuesdays was our day of prayer. And uh, so sometimes people would show up for, for prayer. And, but we're, we're praying for the city. We pray in the morning. We pray at noon. We pray in the evening, praying for our church, praying for the city. And, uh, and so, we, you know, there's about 12 of us in this noon prayer meeting. We're, we're, and we're praying. 
when a lady that we started ministering to who was demonized comes into the room and sits down on the couch. And I go, oh, Lord, I'm here to pray. I'm not here to do this. This is not supposed to be a ministry session. This is a diversion. Oh, Lord, you know, just, we, could you just send your angels just to clamp her lips? <laughs> and sure enough, all of a sudden, she's, she started manifesting. I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? I mean, we're here to pray. And, and, then, and then she springs off of the couch, and she lunges at me, you know, I mean. I mean, the look and everything, and this scream. She gets, she gets halfway across the room, and she freezes. And then her hands get pulled back behind her back. And she is drug back to the couch. Boom. You know what we did? Go. <laughs> did you see that? We have angels in the room. I'm telling you, the big guys always show up. A lot of times when we go to Brazil, we go, you know, sometimes we do these crusades and we'll have the deliverance tent. I mean, you go into the deliverance tent, you're going to see people pretty much bound by angels, you know, hands behind them, things like that, frozen. And they're frozen because, you know, the angels are, 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 are constraining them. I'm... Know this, anytime you minister in the area, you have reinforcements with you. You don't need to be afraid. God backs up the expansion of his kingdom, the preaching of his kingdom, and the, manifest, or the demonstration of his kingdom. He loves to back that up because he's, because he's God. You need to know who you are in the Lord. Whenever you gave your heart to Jesus, there was a transformation that took place. This transformation, when God's spirit comes inside of your spirit, you became a new creature and a new creation. Jesus comes inside of you at that point in time. And the union that you had with him is so amazing and so complete that the Bible, when he talks about, the Bible describes you in Romans 6 and Ephesians 2 and other places, that really whatever Jesus encountered, you encountered too because you're united with Jesus who encountered that. So the Bible would say that you're crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. You're crucified with Christ or you're buried with Christ in, in Romans chapter 6. You're buried with him. You were raised with him. Ephesians 2.5 says that you, you ascended with him into the heavenlies and now you're seated with him at the right hand of the Father. So you have to realize that you died with Christ. You're buried with Christ. <clears throat> Well, I've never been to the Holy Land. I never saw the tomb. It doesn't matter. But the one who was in the tomb is united with you. So therefore, whenever, whenever you gave your heart to him, now you, you were there because you're not, you were so united and intertwined with the one who was there. So when he died on the cross, you died there with him. You were buried with him. When he ascended, you ascended with him. And right now, you are, and this is Ephesians 2, 5, and you can just, it, this is not talking about future tense. It is present tense. You are at this moment seated with him at the right hand of the Father. That is your current position. That, that is a, that is a, a, a now reality. You are there because that is how intertwined you are. So you don't ask the question, how much authority or what do I have authority over? I ask the question, what does Jesus have authority over? Because I'm walking in the authority of the one that I'm united with. So these are the things I have to know on the inside. If you want a good passage to kind of just soak in sometime, and just meditate on. Look at that passage in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, where it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you may know, you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. His power that is working in us, towards us, our power. And then he goes on to describe this power. 
in, in, uh, these are in accordance with the workings of the strength of his might. Verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. So therefore, Jesus, this passage is saying that the power that is working within you is the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead, raise him into heaven, and place him at the right hand of the Father. Now, how much power does it take to do that one? I mean, let's just start with the resurrection. Let's, let's, let's have an earthquake. I mean, how much power does it take to do that one? You're, you roll away a storm, stone, and then you take a dead, lifeless body... Bring it back to life, but you don't give it the old life. You give it a, a glorified, resurrected, eternal body. Like, how much power does it take to do that one? And then it doesn't stop there. Now we take this body, and now he ascends into the right hand of the Father and is placed at that, at that place far above, far above, far above, all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, every name that is named, that's, that's quite a few. Not only in this age, but in the one to come. I mean, whatever's out there, it's, he's, still, he's still in charge. Like, how much power does it take to do that one? Now, now hold your finger up. Come on, you got to respond. Take that finger and stick it in you and say, that power's in me. You see, you will live your life with what you believe, what you know, not your head, but what you heart. I pray that the eyes of your heart, verse 18, the eyes of your heart, I want you to know this down deep. When you know that down deep, you, will, you, you can face anything out there because Jesus can face anything out there. The devil only operates in the places where he finds agreement. And wherever you have come into an agreement with him, with a lie, with a deception, you've now given away your authority. A lot of the deliverance process is helping believers understand where they've come into an agreement with a lie. And not just a head knowledge, but it's a heart knowledge. In other words, I know the truth with my head, but what I really believe in my heart is the lie. Because that's what, if it feels truth, if it feels true, then you've embraced it. That's what you're in agreement with. Whenever my bags do arrive, <clears throat> there are some resources <clears throat> that, I, uh, that we will have available. If they don't come, we'll, we'll work something out, okay, so we can get you some of these. But I just want to tell you what m might show up this week. Uh, the first one is this book on forgiveness. And it was the first book that I wrote. I actually wrote it to lessen my, my counseling load when I was pastoring because I would actually make people read it before they can make a counseling appointment. Some people would read it, take care of take care because almost any counseling situation, you're going to deal with a forgiveness issue. Some people would read it, take care of it. They wouldn't have to make an appointment. Other people would see what we're going to talk about. They didn't want to deal with it, and they wouldn't make an appointment either. My counseling load decreased significantly, you know, when I began to require this. The second reason I wrote it is, is because some people just have to wrestle it through. If you know what it is and what it's not, if you really understood what it is, you'd have no problem doing it. But so it, it's for people who need to wrestle it through. But there's a third reason I wrote it. Because a lot of people, when the books I was reading on forgiveness, they stop with forgiving the person, but yet there, is, there really is another step after that. Because has, has, has this ever happened to you? It's like I forgave somebody, and a few weeks later, the feelings of unforgiveness come back up. 
Well, well, what do you do? Well, I forgive him again. And then I forgive him again. How many times do you got to do that? 70 times 7? They're like, is that, the, is that the right number? Like, But the reason you do that is you have to understand how strongholds are built. Strongholds is, is a system of thinking that we've embraced. What I think, my, my core belief system determines my thinking process, and my thinking determines how I feel, and how I feel oftentimes produces what I do. So I, I pretty much start with my, my belief system, so in, how, in my thinking system there. So if I have a thinking system that's in agreement with bitterness, it's going to produce feelings of bitterness, even though I've made a decision to forgive. So I have to tear down a thinking structure that's in agreement with bitterness and rebuild a thinking structure that's in, in agreement with compassion. For when compassion rules, then those feelings, that'll determine what you feel. So when you have compassion ruling you, you're not going to be having those feelings of, of, of unforgiveness and bitterness. The second half of this book is about how to tear down a stronghold of bitterness and rebuild a stronghold of compassion. <clears throat> the book that may come <laughs> is this book on liberating. This is one I wrote just a, just a few years ago. And um, I, I was kind of forced into writing it, but because I just never wanted to write to do it, but they made me do it. So I had to do it. The, <laughs> the first half of the book it's really a lot that I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, today and tomorrow. The, the second half of the book is how to rebuild a godly stronghold. The, the forgiveness book focus, I do a lot of the work for you in the forgiveness book. But here, it, regardless of what it is, I did my doctoral dissertation on post-deliverance discipleship. In other words, when, you know, when the demon leaves and it wants to come back, how do you keep a thing from coming back? Well, usually, you know, you, you got to break all the agreements. And, and the way, one of the ways you do that is by building a godly stronghold, a, strong, a godly thinking structure that's in agreement, you know, with truth. And um, exposing the lies, exposing the false identity, embracing the true identity. So the second half of the book, and I'm not going to talk about that at all this week, okay? It's, it's, it's the sec that's how to, how to do that. Okay, are we, are we good? Oftentimes in this one, I, I, I was, I don't never bring this to sell, but I, I did because I, I'm not going to get to everything that I wanted to, or that I oftentimes get to do in this, in the empowered conference there. Usually we were able to have a, an, another day in there where I'm able to take a couple of hours and break things off of people like soul ties and power of words, generational stuff. And so we're not going to do that uh, this time. So we wanted to give you some uh, availability of some resources to do that. Uh, the little uh, video thing out there on the session, we'll have that in there. But I, a couple of years I did a, a show with Sid Roth. Some of you familiar with Sid Roth has the It's Supernatural thing. And you know what, what he does, how he sells the book and the three CD set? This is the three CD set. And so, you know, he, after a couple of years, he asked me if I wanted them. I said, sure. It's, it's CDs, so it's not, it's CDs. Like, I, you know, I don't have a CD player. Well, that's, you probably have one in your car or an old computer. Or, by the way, you know, DVD players will also play CDs, just letting you know that. So, anyway, that, this has all those sessions in there. In fact, more things than I actually even teach in this time, like, like uh, Fear Bonds. Uh, Anyway, that's, if the luggage arrives, <laughs> but if not, we'll work, we'll work something out to get some of this stuff to you, okay? In fact, you probably get a better deal if, if they don't come. Just letting you know. All right, why don't you stand? Are we good? Repeat after me. I'm a child of the King. I'm co heir with Jesus. All Jesus bought and paid for 
is my inheritance. I'm united with Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. I died with him. I was buried with him. I was raised with him. I am seated with him in the heavenlies. Far above all rule, all power, all authority, above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Therefore, I carry the authority of Christ. I have authority over sickness, over sin, over the flesh, over demons, and over the world. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. I will displace the darkness. I have the full armor of God. For the weapons of my warfare are not fleshly. They're divinely powerful to tear down the strongholds of darkness. I can do all things through Christ because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world.